we've been going over tables. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a minute to review um, what we've done so far. And then we are going to um, look at some of the accessibility issues with tables and some of the things that you can do um, to make the tables more accessible. When we wrap that up, we'll start talking about JavaScript, which is what we'll do for the rest of the semester. All right. A table is where you have a structure where there are rows and columns of data, such as this. Um, now, one thing that you notice, if you look at this, is that this being an earlier version of Internet Explorer doesn't do exactly what we did. It doesn't look exactly the same as when we viewed it in Google Chrome. Notice how in Google Chrome, each alternating field, or row rather, is um, a shade of gray, whereas in Internet Explorer, it's not. Um, again, that's because of the version of Internet Explorer this is, and at least um, the one thing we could say is at least, I mean, the table's still workable. It's not as though you can't use the table in Internet Explorer. It's that um, it just it doesn't have the exact same appearance. Um, and that's sort of the good news of, of HTML and CSS is unlike other programming languages, when things don't work, they typically don't blow everything up. I mean, sometimes they do. In some cases, they do. You can make a mistake that will, will keep your entire web page from displaying. But in other cases, um, it will go. It just won't necessarily have all the functionality um, that the full page would have. Um, an alternative way that we could do this, I think we talked about last time, would be to create a class for alternating row and then apply the style on the class and uh, apply the class to every other table row. Let's look at the code here. Notice we have a table tag. That indicates the start and the end of the table. The table contains a caption, which is an explanation of the purpose of the table. And it appears on the top, like this. The advantage of using a caption instead of simply using an H1 is it is part of the table's HTML. It's part of the table's markup, so it goes with it. We then have a series of TRs, which stands for table rows. And each table row contains either TDs or THs. THs indicate table headers. TDs indicates table rows. Oh, I'm sorry. TDs equals, uh, let's rewind. TH equals table headers. TDs equals table data. I was looking at the TR as, as I was saying that. But yeah, TDs represent table data. So typically, a table will have one row that contains THs, and then the rest of the rows contain TDs. We saw a couple ways to do the alternating color. The one way we, we talked about was to do this. But again, that only works in browsers that can handle that. And in this case, this earlier version of, of IE doesn't. What we could do is, again, we have a class of alt, 
we could put a background of the different color. That makes everyone, because I have, I have two different um, styles. So I should get rid of the other one. So now every other one is there. So I could do one or the other. Um, we have a pretty old version of Internet Explorer here. So I wouldn't feel bad if I use the CSS3 style rule like this and it didn't work in Internet Explorer because it would only not work in the oldest versions of Internet Explorer. All right. We talked about last time how the appearance of the table depends on a combination of your CSS plus the rules that the browser has built in. All right. So, for example, if we don't specify a column size, it will sort of figure out um, what size to make it. All right. If we do specify a column size, it will do its best to follow it. Um, except it will um, make any adjustments if you're asking the browser to do something that it doesn't want to do. For example, cut off data. So like in this case, we have a width of 50%, a width of each column of 20%, a width of the city column as 40%. So if you look at this, you'll notice that it takes up half the screen, the city column is approximately twice as big as the month columns. At a certain point, though, if we squash it down, it's not able to do all the things that you asked it to do. So it can't give the city 40% and give each of these 20% because the words January and February would be cut off. So it does the best that it can. And it in this case, ends up compressing the city column more narrow than we had asked it to be. Any questions on any of these tags? Accessibility um, considerations with a table. People that can see associate the data with the column and row header simply by visually looking up and to the side. So. We see this 32 here is meant to be the March temperature for Cleveland, simply by going up and across. Now, person that is using a screen reader to access a table, the table is read to them um, in, in a, like a straight line. They call it linearizing the table. So the, the, the table would be read city, January, February, March, Cleveland, 32, and so on down the line. If done in that way, it's very difficult to tell belongs with what column. So what you can do is you can specify what the table and row headers are. And you can do that in this way. Um, with a scope attribute. There's a good write-up here on the, actually it's just COL, that I can put for the headers going across the top of the page, they each have a scope of the column. In other words, this is the header for the entire column. So January is the header for the January column. So I put scope equals COL. The other thing I can do is Cleveland, for example, is the header 
for this row. So Cleveland is the header for this row. So I could go in and say scope equals row. And I could do that for each of the cities. Oops. Like that. All the way down the line and finish it up. And that makes the table more accessible because a screen reader then can associate with the elements the row and the column that each of the thing is the header for. THs should always have scopes associated with them. So really, these should be THs because Boston you could think of as being a header for that column and so on. Um, that would be a good question, and that would, uh, in other words, exactly how the screen reader tells you uh, that that is a column header, I am not sure, all right? Uh, and I'm sh uh, the one thing I am sure of is it would vary with the specific screen reader that was being used. Um, would have to sample the different screen readers to see exactly how that would get implemented. The idea, though, is this is the hook that you put in. All right, this is, this is sort of like your part of the responsibility of a developer is to put in the scope attributes. And then once you do that, however the screen reader implements that functionality, you've at least done your job. You haven't defeated the assistive technology, you know. You have built your building with an elevator on it so people with wheelchairs can go upstairs exactly how that wheelchair works or what kind of wheelchair it is or whatever. There's all sorts of different kinds of wheelchairs, but you've done your job by providing the reasonable accommodation. And then the screen reader, each screen reader could be implemented in a slightly different way um, to, uh, to, to handle that. Now, there's a couple of things. Um, there's a couple of advanced things that we could do with tables that I'm going to briefly mention, but we're going to avoid doing because they sort of really, really cloud uh, the situation up. One is you can actually have columns go across, columns or rows go across multiple columns or rows. The example they show in the, on this page is they have a list of different daughters of Shelley. This is kind of weird that Shelley has a daughter named Beth by birth and by marriage. They're both the same age and born, uh, born on the same day. But anyhow, in this case, this column spans, or this cell spans two rows. And you can put a call span and a row span attribute on uh, a column. And you can have this, the column go across more than one row or more than one column. It's kind of like in Excel when you merge cells together. All right, when you merge cells together in Excel, you can say, okay, this cell actually is this column and this column merged together. So you can do that. The other thing you can actually do is you can actually nest tables inside of tables. And that is also generally a bad idea for a couple reasons. For accessibility reasons, it's a nightmare. And for maintainability reasons, it's difficult. Um, it would be best if you wanted to nest tables to break things out and make two simple tables instead of having one complicated table. All right. There is something you can do if your table does get complicated using headers and IDs. And it's not generally recommended because the scope is usually sufficient. All right? But what you can do is you can assign, show an example here, 
you assign an ID to each header, and then for each table data, you say that the header for that table cell, and then you supply the IDs of the cells that are the header for that. Let me see if I can find another example. Here shows what we talked about before where we have rows and um, column headers and we say specify the scope for those. Um, here's an example of a row span where this TD goes across two rows. Here they talk about a table being more or less complicated because this is actually sort of like two tables combined. Here's the example where you assign an uh, ID to the header and then you specify for each table cell the list of the IDs that are the header for that cell. Generally, though, using the scope attribute is enough. And with simple tables, that's what I would recommend doing. There's a couple other tags um, that can be used, um, not necessarily for accessibility, but for um, styling your tables. And especially effective if you're printing tables. And that is the T-head, T-data, and what's the third? T head, T body, and T foot. So for example, the T head would go around your rows that contain all your headers. If you had a row at the bottom of the table that was sort of a summary or maybe an average of the averages, you could put that row in a T foot. This doesn't really have an accessibility impact, but you can do some styling things with it. So for example, we could make the footer a different color or have a different border or something like that. Also, if we print out a table with a header or footer, it will, it will know to put the header on each page 
um, on each page that it prints out. Um, and that can be good too. So notice as we do this, it really has no impact on the way the table looks. Oops. the other change I made. Has no impact on how it looks. All right, but we could style it. So for example, we could make the footer have a background of yellow or something indicating that there was something special about that row. And again, it has an impact when you go and print it out as well. Any questions about this? Yeah. Well, it, I mean, if you think about a table, like if you, even if you think about something in Excel, this is, this is what you have, basically. You have headings on the top. You have the bulk of the data. And then you have totals. All right. So, this is the T-foot tag for the totals that you have at the bottom. This is the T-head tag that you have for the headers at the top. And remember, we're looking at a very simple um, table example. There are more complex table examples where you could actually have two rows of headers. All right. Then finally, the bulk of the data, the data rows, would be the T-body. All right? So if you can imagine, if we did a budget for the next 12 months, we could do something like this. We could have, we're doing the budgets for um, a company, let's say. We could have a table that looks like this. Fixed costs, variable cost. Each of these could have a call span of three, let's say. And then we could have, under fixed costs, we could have a, you know, um, the lease of our factory. Um, salaries of the employee and um, utilities. And under variable, maybe it would be inventory, overtime, and so on. It's been a while I had accounting, so bear with me on these examples. These two rows form the T-head. We could then have, for each month, a row. And then on the bottom, we could have total, average, and maximum, let's say. So if we were doing a table like this, this is a T-head section, which we might want to have look some way. This is a T-foot section, which we would want to look another way, possibly. And the T-head section, for example, we would, we would want repeated every time we went to print it out, right? If we went to print it out, the, t the header should be on each page. 
And then finally, we have the data here that we might want to look a certain way. That's what the T data would allow us to do. So without, how would you do this otherwise? If you were to do this otherwise, you would assign an ID or a class to each one of these and say, these two TRs I want to treat one way, these three TRs I want to treat another way, and the rest of the table I want to treat another way. Well, you could do that, and that's not like a horrible solution. But another option that you have is to group all those under T data and just say, I want to treat the T data section this way. All right? So again, this would, being able to do this allows you to not have to give an ID or a class for the, the rows in this section. Okay? In each of the sections. So these three rows that are in the T footer, I could give a different style to. These three rows or two rows that are in the T head, I could get a different style to. And the 12 rows that are in the T data, I could give a different style to simply by with one rule. If you've noticed, um, you know, sort of the hierarchy of style rules. If possible, to associate a style rule with an HTML tag, that's kind of desirable, right? Because there's already going to be HTML tags. You don't have to go and apply a specific class or ID. So that's sort of the simplest one. Or if you have a nesting, like a TR within the T data section, you want styled a certain way. So if possible, you can, to do things via strictly style rules based on the, on the HTML tag, that's probably the most straightforward. If you can't do that, then you look to, to your other options of, okay, can I use a class, can I use an ID for it? So this allows you to do a style based on the HTML tags for those particular rows. Other questions? All right. Hope that wasn't too confusing uh, today. Um, really, uh, the bulk of the table stuff we covered last time. Uh, today was sort of finer points as far as accessibility goes. Um, we talked about a lot of things you could do and, and so on. Um, do you have to use a T head, T foot, and T body? Absolutely not. But they're there and they're available for you if you want to um, control the formatting of the table um, in a different way. Or for printing very large tables, they're beneficial. Um, additionally, um, the, the scope is usually good enough as far as accessibility goes. So if you put the scope of column or scope of row in your headers, that's usually good enough. But you do have the ability to define headers and IDs. Um, and that, that allows you to sort of pinpoint a little more uh, precisely which table headers go with which data cells. All right, JavaScript. Let's draw up here our basic interaction between the client and a web server. We talked about this when we talked about forms and server-side scripting. Whoops. Typically, on a website, the user makes a request and the client, by the client I mean the user, the person who is using a laptop or a desktop or a mobile device that's using a browser. They're connected to the internet. They request a page from a web server. The web server does its thing and sends a page back over. And what gets sent over? Well, HTML, CSS gets sent over. And in addition, JavaScript can be sent over. JavaScript is sent over to allow the client to do some manipulation of the page without going back to the server. 
Normally, the client requests from the server new content, new pages, and so on. But there's some things that the client can do, and can do it very quickly, compared to having to make another request through the internet to a web server and getting back a new page. Let me show you uh, an example of that. Let's go to... Let's go to ESPN. All right. So, how do I request a page from ESPN's web server? Well, there's a couple ways that you request. The most obvious one is by typing in your browser the website that you want to go to. When I do that, what happens is my request goes through the internet. The internet routes it to the ESPN server. The ESPN server looks at my request, oh, they want the ESPN homepage, does any processing it needs to, needs to do, and then sends back to my client computer the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. All right? So, another way to request a page would be to click on a link. So if I want to find out more about this game and I click on the link, boom, I request another page. And the same process happens again. A new URL goes to the server. Um, the server does its thing and, and prepares the content strong, and sends me Got back. To. You don't come back strong. Imitators will try to replace you. Trust me. You putting food on my family's table? Trying to replace me? <laughs> and sends us uh, to uh, a page and we get, we get the content uh, on that page. All right. So that's normally how it works. We make a request and the server satisfies it. The server satisfies it by sending us back the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, so anytime we want new content, that's a request to the server. All right? 15 and 0 the Warriors are? Wow. At any rate, um, now, there's certain things, though, there's certain content where it would be a hassle if every time we wanted to see a piece of content, we had to go to the server. Let me show you an example. If I put my mouse on this, all right, or I put my mouse over NBA or Major League Baseball or college football or soccer or so on. Notice what happens. Immediately I get another menu. All right, now what are some observations that we can make about this menu? The response is immediate. All right, there's no waiting for the server to send us that menu. All right. Unlike when I go and click on another page where there's a little bit of lag for it to display. All right. Now, again, we're on a very fast Internet connection. At least today is, it's working fast, apparently. Not always. All right. But it doesn't take long to refresh the page. But we can visibly tell that there's something going on and it's reloading a new page. Whereas this... There's no delay whatsoever. As soon as we put our mouse over there, the new menu appears. All right? You can come to some conclusions based on that. All right? Namely, that we are not asking the server for new content. That we already have been delivered that content. We are simply showing and hiding that content. And this is where JavaScript comes in. JavaScript can be used for several different things, but most of the things that it does are, is some variation of this. You take a page, all right, that has content on it, and you go and you change the content a little bit without having to go back to the server. 
How does that happen? Well, when we load this page initially, we get everything that you see here, but we also get the stuff that you don't see. For example, each one of these menus got delivered to us. We are simply not seeing those menus. All right. How is it that we are not seeing them? We're not seeing them because the CSS is set up to make those menu items invisible. All right. So remember, we can use CSS to, to control the formatting and appearance of items on a web page. All right, the, the different attributes of items. Well, one of the attributes of an element on a web page is whether you can see it or not, whether it's visible or not. So when we request the home page initially, we get back all the visible elements plus some things that are hidden from us. All right, namely all the pull down menus. All right. What JavaScript does is JavaScript's a programming language that makes your page interactive. And what do I mean by interactive? I mean the user does something, the page responds back. All right? So there's a user action that gets the ball rolling. I put my mouse over that item. The page responds. How does it respond? It makes that section of the page visible. All right. How does it do that? Well, it manipulates the HTML and CSS. The same HTML and CSS we use to originally set properties on HTML elements, we can use code to change that. So in other words, there's CSS code that makes all those menus invisible. All right. Well, we simply change that CSS code interactively, dynamically, to go and change it to make those menus visible. All right. So that's one example of JavaScript. And again, there's like a recipe here. All right. First step of the process is the page gets loaded and the page contains some content that we can't see and it contains JavaScript to respond to a user action. All right. So when we first go to this page, we get everything you see, the hidden menus, and some JavaScript instructions that says how to change the page based on user actions. All right. That's the first step of the process. The second step of the process is that a user actually goes and does one of those actions. So they put their mouse over something or they click on something. All right. The third step then is for the JavaScript in the page that's embedded in the page that runs on the browser to go and change aspects of the page. All right. In this case, it goes and it makes the menu area visible here. As we move out, it makes the old menu invisible and shows us the new menu. So that's the recipe, interactivity. Request the server. We get back our content plus a script that allows us to change the content. Now the advantage of doing it this way is that once the page is loaded, it provides sort of a seamless experience for the user. Could you imagine if you were on a slow internet connection and if I put my mouse over here, I had to wait for a request to go to the server and come back with the content. That would make these menus work very clunky and wouldn't give us the good, seamless, quick user experience that we have here. So JavaScript provides sort of a win-win. All right, It's a win for the user because they get an immediate response. I don't have to sit and wait for the menu to appear. I put my mouse over that, bang, the menu appears. 
It's also a win from the server because the server is not bothered with all these little requests to give me content for this menu or that menu. So it really provides an optimal solution and a balancing between what the client is doing, what the server is doing. Now one thing about JavaScript server-side code is it's not going to do anything too extensive. For example, making something visible or invisible is not very extensive. JavaScript doesn't have the capability to do some of the more advanced things that, that are done on the server. For example, to do a, a database query or something like that. Those things need still to be handled on the server. So the server does handle those things. So it's like separating and giving the browser some small tasks that makes everyone's life better. So they offload some of the task and some of the behavior on the page to client-side JavaScript so another request doesn't have to be made back to the server and the page responds immediately so everyone is happy. Other examples of JavaScript. photo gallery here. So we load this page, we get this photo gallery. When we click on this photo, notice that immediately the larger photo comes up. And if we click on it, it zooms. And we can drag it around to get a closer look. And we can click the arrow and show the next image. Notice again, that happens immediately. It doesn't have to sit and go to the server and think and wait um, for a while for it to give us a response. Because the JavaScript code has all been loaded first. All right? And therefore, as we navigate around through this photo gallery, the response that we get is virtually immediate because we have everything that we need. We got it initially when the page loaded and the, the, the JavaScript code is running on the client so there's no need to go back through the internet to request anything from the server. So they have a couple options here. There's a minimal one that allows us just to scroll through and so on. A third example of JavaScript is with form validation. All right, remember we talked about there being HTML5 form controls that, for example, limits us to putting in only a proper email address or a number between a certain range of numbers or, or something like that. All right. Um, That, those, unfortunately, again, don't work in all browsers. Not all browsers support them. And we saw that they act like text boxes um, if you are using an unsupported browser. Um, what you can have is JavaScript code, though, to do the validation to step in on browsers that do not support. So let's go to our old Internet Explorer. And let's go and try to register on Amazon. Oh. Go and create an account. And I can put in my name. I'm going to put in an email that doesn't, isn't valid. And I'm going to put in an unmatching email and I'll do the same thing with the password and I create my Amazon account alright 
and we get a message that says there's a problem with your account. All right. Now, unfortunately, this validation isn't very good because it only showed me one of the problems that I had. All right. But there is other validation routines that can run and um, show us, um, you know, um, all the errors that we have. Let's go and let's go to let's go to Canvas and try to log in. Again, the name or password is incorrect. Now, I'm not sure exactly how those two validations work. Those actually could have been running on the server side. Um, but the idea is, is that if you implement client-side validation, then you can perform those checks for obvious errors without having to go to the server. So, for example, the client-side can't tell if I have the right login ID or not. That's something that requires looking up in the database. That's something that the server has to do. But the client side certainly can tell if I forgot to enter in a user ID or password. And that's the kind of thing that client side code um, does. On Wednesday, we'll start looking at some examples of this that are going to follow the formula of the user action, the page responding without going back to the server. All right. We'll see you up in lab.